Welcome to Doing Time with Joe. I'm your host, Joe Baker. I got a great episode for you today. Uh, but before I get into the episode, I want to tell you about this new initiative that I have. It's called the Doing Time with Joe Contributor. And basically, all I'm asking is that anybody out there, no matter what profession you're in, no matter what line of work you're in, uh, you can just be a homebody. It doesn't matter. If you have something that you want to say, a thought, an opinion, or a comment about like crime, gangs, drugs, whatever the case may be, prison, you got a loved one that's in prison, if you're in a relationship with somebody in prison, I want to give you the opportunity to make a, vi a five minute, at least five minute video clip uh, or an audio clip telling us about that so that you know I can share that with my listeners on the podcast. Basically, just don't forget that what I'm trying to do is to deter crime. I'm not trying to promote or glorify it, but just give us, you know what I'm saying, what your experience has been like in, this, in those particular situations. I would appreciate uh, anybody that sends that in. If you want more information about the initiative, uh, send me an email at doingtimewithjot at gmail.com and I'll make sure that you get all the information that you need before you start to shoot, okay? Appreciate that. But let, let's get into the show, right? Today, I'm going to be talking about, you know, back in my day when I used to get drugs in the penitentiary. And, and I don't want you to focus f so strongly on the fact that I was getting drugs in. I know that's a tantalizing part of the story. But I want you to focus more, and I'm going to try to round it out too when I'm telling the story about how much time is wasted in the preparation of trying to do something nefarious when that that kind of time can be put towards some positive. But anyway, this particular uh, situation that I found myself in years ago, this was about back in the early 2000s. You know, I was at another facility, of course, and uh, I was one of the main people that was getting drugs into the institution, right? And I know a lot of people right now listening like, please, Joe, don't tell them what the business is. This ain't got nothing to do with nobody else. This was a move exclusive to me. Now, maybe other people knew about it. Maybe other people were doing it, but I didn't know nothing about it, and they didn't know my business. And the only people that knew my business was the people involved in the business. You feel me? So let's just keep that straight, right? But anyway, this particular move that I had, right, was uh, through the mail, right? Now, a lot of people talk about how easy it is to get something moved through the mail. It's really not. And it takes a lot of time. To, to cultivate those routes and the patience that you need. And you particularly got to have somebody on the other end of it, meaning the person that's going to be receiving the mail that's willing to do whatever uh, you're asking them to do at great risk to themselves, right? So anyway, this particular move that I had, it's called the package move, right? And basically what I would do, I would get a big box. I would get a big box um, that could hold probably like 50 books, 50 regular size books, right? And the package would probably weigh... Uh, no less than maybe 30, 40 pounds, right? It's that big, right? So what I would do is I would, I would package it up. And now, at, let me let me back up a little bit. Uh, back then, the post office the, at, on the compound at the prison, uh, one of my guys worked in the post office right there. So that's what allowed this move to be, you know what I'm saying, so straight, right? Because he would be up there to watch what's going on and let me know when... Uh, the heat was on or when, you know, everything was straight, right? So anyway, what I would do, I would go to the uh, mail room and I would mail a package out to my guys on the streets, right? It would have nothing but books in it. That's it. Nothing of real value or anything like that. So when once I mailed that package out, I would have to wait a few days, sweating, wondering what's going on, calling my people, making sure that they got the package. And once they got the package, what they would do is take out the books, take all the books out of the box, and then they will replace those contents with all the types of drugs that I that I wanted. I would get tobacco, weed, cocaine. Sometimes I would even have them uh, put green money in the package, right? So, but here's the thing about that. That box, that package, had to weigh the exact same amount that the package weighed when they received it, right? So that's key. That package had to weigh the exact same amount. Now, but once they did that and made, made sure everything was straight, what they would do is put return to sender on it. I know a lot of y'all looking and wondering like, well, darn, does something like that work? Well, absolutely. It's return to sender. So they would take it to the post office and get through. Now, let me back up again. Let me back up again, y'all. Let me. Back, I'm moving too fast for myself. Let me back up again. I know a lot of y'all probably saying, well, wow, how can he get that through the dogs? They got dogs at the post office, so on and so forth, this, this, and that. Well, back in the day, all we would do is take and wrap up the package that's in the mail, 
wrap it up in uh, coffee. We take some coffee and wrap it up. We wash it off real good with ammonia, then wrap it up in some coffee and put it in there. Now, does it actually work? I don't know. Maybe they didn't have the dogs running through the post office that day. I don't have a clue, but it worked every time I did it. That's all I can tell you, right? So the package would be put in the mail at the post office and it would come back to the prison, return to sender. Now, that would use to take about three days. Three days going out to get to my people, three days coming back. And let me correct something. Let me make sure I point out something. When I talk about my people, I'm talking about my gang members. You feel me? I ain't talking about none of my family members. My family members would turn me into the police if I asked them to do stuff like this. So let's just keep that straight, right? So anyway, my brothers, when they send, they would send the package back in the mail and it would take about three days before it got back to the prison. And my brother, they would be up in the post office working he would let me know when the package is there. They would set the packages that I returned to sender on the shelf. So he would let me know that it's up there. And I would just sit and wait. It would take about another two days before the, the person that worked in the mail room to get around to calling people up there that had returned to sender. The process back then was when they would call me back up there, they would say, oh, Baker, you got the wrong address. Something's wrong on this or blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, that's got to be the right address. Y'all tripping, blah, blah, blah. I'm putting on the show. I'm stunting hard. I'm trying to make them believe that I know what I'm talking about and they done messed up and they're trying to mess up my package from going after my people. You feel what I'm saying? So what I would say is like, hold on a second. Let me run back to the cell and get the address because I don't know it off, off the top of my head. Let me go back and get the address so we can compare these addresses. So I would run back to the cell like I'm really concerned that, you know, my mail didn't get to where it's supposed to get to, right? I would run back to the cell and I'd already have it in my pocket. You know what I'm saying? The address that I need, I'm just putting on the show. Run back to the cell, sit in there for a couple of minutes, look at the clock, say, okay, that's long enough. Get back up, go ask the officer to call me. I run back up to the post office. By the time I got back up to the post office, they're sitting there waiting on me. I pull it out of my pocket and I'm looking at it and I'm like, look, the addresses are the same. And they were like, well, something's gotta be wrong on that end. You need to check and make sure what's going on, right? So. What I would do is say, well, I'm going to call them back tonight and I'm going to make sure this address is what it's supposed to be. And they said, well, in the meantime, between time, you can't leave this package up here. And I'm like, oh. well, now they wouldn't say that all the time. Sometimes they would say, do you want to leave the package up here? And then I'd be like, nah, I'll just take it with me in case, you know, something's wrong. I might have to end up remailing it out. And if that's the case, then they said I'm going to have to put more stamps on it. So I would just take the package with me. Walking straight across the compound in front of captains, lieutenants, and anybody else that's walking across the compound. I'm walking across the compound with pounds of tobacco, weed, and cocaine, and in some cases, green money. Straight right to the pod. Ain't nobody suspecting a thing. The post office has done its job for me. <laughs> I get back to the unit. I tell my seller, look, watch the door. Call a couple of my guys. They watch the cell. I open the package. Everything is Gucci. Everything is in there. Load it down. And then I, of course, you know, take the stuff, distribute it out, and that's the end of the game. You feel me? Go back to the post office the next day and be like, look, I'm going to send that back out next week or a couple of weeks. You know what I'm saying? I couldn't catch anybody last night, right? And the amazing thing about this, every single time I gave them that explanation, that excuse, it worked. I'd come with a different address, it, but, you know, me... I'm the only one that know that the address was real, but I would send it to a different brother in a different location. I never used the same address. But I'm focusing, I want you to focus on how much time and effort I was putting into conning. It took a lot of time, it took a lot of effort for me to con all of those people into believing that I'm genuine, into believing that I was doing the right thing. You right? You understand what I'm saying? And what I wasn't realizing is that doing all of that conning, I got caught up in my own game. And it became a part of my personality and who I am. You know what I'm saying? Or who I was at that time anyway, right? So what that led me to is just a life of continual conning. I didn't even know where the line was anymore. You know what I'm saying? Like, who am I? Am I this Joe Baker that was raised you know what I'm saying, by his grandparents to, to respect the law, to uh, obey the rules and do this and do that? Or was I this person that just said, the hell with it all? And for the, the truth of the matter, I had become this person that said, the hell with it all, more so than the person that my grandparents had raised. I had spent so much time in trying to perfect my con 
that I ended up conning myself without even realizing. And I think that's what a lot of us do. We get so caught up in the game trying to achieve whatever it is that we're trying to achieve on the nefarious side that we really forget all of the things that we were taught by our parents or grandparents or whoever raised us. And we get caught up in trying to be this person that can make this move, that can get this pack, that can get this money. Because that's what I was doing. I was getting money. And I rationalized and I told myself that this is okay because this is just about money. I'm not hurting anybody. But what I was doing is hurting people. You hurt people when you lie to them. Whether you know them or not, have a personal relationship with them or not, when you're lying to somebody, you're hurting them. What does that mean? How are you hurting somebody that you don't know? You're taking a person that is using this, this level of trust in communicating with another human being and you're lying to them. You're convincing them that you're being honest. And what that would do, when they find out that you were lying to them, they will start to question their judgment. And then they'll start to apply that to people that they really know and care about. Can I trust what anybody is saying? And that's something that I don't think we really pay attention to. When we lie to somebody, conning somebody, we cause that person to start to have doubt in their own ability to be able to see a person for who they are. And then we get upset because people, when we change our lives, when we get upset because people don't trust us. What we have to do is spend just as much time and energy uh, trying to reestablish that trust, becoming a trustworthy person, as we did in becoming a con artist. And that's what I want you to focus on. Just because you don't know somebody and you're lying to them about something that you're doing doesn't mean you're not hurting them. You are hurting them. You're damaging their ability to make a sound decision on, oh, this person said something, can I believe that? And then they start to call into question all kinds of things. Just wanted to drop that on you. See what you think about that. Let me know what you think about that. You know what I'm saying? The con is con of yourself. Just remember that. The con is conning yourself, and there are no victimless crimes. There are no crimes where people don't get hurt. People do get hurt when you lie to them. And being a con artist is a liar. And when you're lying, you're hurting people. And that's what I was doing. Even though I was getting money, there's no excuse. You don't, you don't, you don't have any right under any circumstances to hurt somebody because you're trying to get you some money. Just wanted to drop that on y'all. This has been another episode of Doing Time with Joe. I'm your host, Joe Baker. Peace, y'all.